Hi, my name is Mark Riggins, and I'm pastor here at LifePoint, located in Plano, Texas, and we meet here every Sunday at 1030, and we are here for your family. I hope today's message is an encouragement to you. Well, good morning, LifePoint. I know you're ready for the baptism. I am too, and I promise it's coming, but I want to talk to you a little bit, and then we're going to jump right to the baptisms here in a little bit. If you're new here, we, we again want to welcome you, but I also want you to know that here at LifePoint, we really do have a heart for the next generation, and you can see that if you walk over to our student center and see it. If you were to walk back to our, our children's uh, building and you were to see that, you were to see all the people who are serving back there, how much that we have a heart for that. And then many of you who gave this summer, so that students could go to youth camp and could be scholarship to youth camp, and it's making a big difference. And I want you to know that today we're going to talk specifically about the next generation. The question, though, is how do we define the next generation? Who is in the next generation? And the way I want us to define it today is it's the people coming behind you. So if you're in your 20s and 30s, then it's going to be the children and the teenagers coming behind you. If you're like me and you're in your 40s and 50s, it's going to be people who are in their 20s and 30s. If you're in your 60s and 70s, it's people who are about 20 years behind you and so on. These are the people who are coming up behind you. And here's why that's so important. It means that we all have a part and we all have a responsibility. Here's what I want you to know, that all of us are not only responsible for our faith, but we are also responsible for the faith of the people coming behind us. Because there was somebody ahead of us who handed us the baton of faith. And we get to enjoy this relationship with Jesus, and now we are responsible for passing it to the people who are behind us. You see, Jesus, when he came to earth 2,000 years ago as the founder of Christianity, and he launched this brand new thing, do you know who he launched this brand new thing with? The next generation. These young disciples who he went and mentored, and he passed the baton of faith, and he entrusted the most important thing in human history, the church, with them. And here we are 2,000 years later because they grabbed that baton and they weren't perfect just like we won't be, but they ran and God blessed and here we are. But here's the problem. We see over and over throughout history how effective it is when people like us decide to pass the faith on to the next generation, but we have an enemy. It is an enemy that is relentless and it is an enemy that every generation has faced and it's an enemy that you and I face and it is the true enemy of the church. And you might think, oh, I know what the true enemy of the church is. It's Republicans or Democrats. Or you might say, no, it's bad theology. Or you might even say, no, it's the devil himself. But according to Jesus, in his final prayer on earth, as he began to pray, he revealed the true enemy of the church, which is division. Jesus said the only way we won't be effective in reaching the next generation is if the current generation isn't united. But if a current generation becomes divided, then the next generation dismisses their faith. And in our country right now, in our world right now, we have a problem with this, don't we? We have a problem with division. And guess who smiles at the division even in the church today? It is the author of division. And Jesus, at the end of his life, he prayed a prayer specifically for the next generations that were coming, and he prayed for unity because he knew that we would occasionally struggle, we as in the capital C church, those who are following Christ, those who are Jesus followers around the world, we would struggle with this kind of division that comes in our lives, in our own hearts, and in our churches even at times. And Jesus was very intentional. And so I want you to see this, Jesus' final prayer. It sets up beautifully where we want to go today. If you've got your Bibles, I hope you'll open them to John chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the pew. You can turn to page 878 in that pew Bible. And I want you to see the final prayer of Jesus as he prays specifically for future generations. John chapter 17, look what Jesus prays at the very end the final prayer of our Savior. 
He says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples. My prayer is not for them alone. But I pray also for those who will believe. These are future Christians. These are future generations. I pray for them who will believe in me through their message, through the disciples' message, that all of them may be, say that word with me, one. Unity. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Why is this so important that there be unity in his church, that there be unity amongst Jesus' followers? Why is this so important? He says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. Future generations will be more likely to believe by the unity of the current generation. And they will believe specifically that you have sent me. They will believe in Jesus as a result of our unity power of unity. Now look at verse 23. As Jesus continues his prayer, he says, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to, say these next two words with me, complete unity. Complete unity was the final prayer of Jesus for his Jesus followers. Then he said, when that is achieved, the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them even as you loved me. Now you and I both know that complete unity is not uniformity. It doesn't mean that we're gonna agree on everything, but what it means is we will fight for unity even when there is disagreement. Why? Why did this matter so much to Jesus? Because the next generation will leave faith and will leave church if we don't get this right. In fact, if, we, if it becomes obvious that we are against groups of people or we are against issues more than we are for people, then we will nullify our witness to the next generation. And why does that matter? Well, when you see the faces of the next generation, here's a picture of our students just about three weeks ago at a group event called Launch where they were kicking off the fall season. And when you look at these faces, these faces are people who believe in a Jesus that you and I believe in, but they're looking at our unity as Jesus followers to determine their faith as the next generation. And Jesus says their future faith is largely determined on our unity, on our following this Jesus. You see, when you look at this picture, I don't know about you, but I look at this picture and I see not the future church, I see the current church. And I look at this picture and I see people whose influence will continue to grow as they become future parents, as they become civic leaders, as they become business leaders, as they become board members, as they become pastors, as they become the ones who are leading the church forward. This is an important group of people who are right behind us. And here's the thing. They must have a strong faith as they enter the complexities of adulthood. They must not be left with a weak faith that we've sort of passed them by as we're debating what we're debating. But this isn't just a church thing. This isn't just even a student ministry thing. This is personal for all of us, isn't it? Here's a picture of my family. And this is uh, my wife, Ginger, and then our four kids, uh, Reagan, Kennedy, Madison, and Lincoln. And Reagan and Kennedy, Reagan serves on our worship team and Kennedy serves in, 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 uh, as a greeter out here. They're both uh, finishing up later this semester from Collin College, they'll be transferring to a four-year university and then Lincoln's a senior in high school and Madison, who's our tallest female in our family, is our freshman in high school. I love my family, but you know what I can tell you and guarantee you? There's no guarantee that they will always walk with Jesus. That's beyond my control as a parent. But what Ginger and I do want to do is we don't ever want them to doubt that we believe what we're inviting them to believe. In the same way for you, this is personal, isn't it? Because you have kids, you have grandkids, you have nieces and nephews and neighbors and people that you really care about. This next generation idea is not just some uh, you know, sterile group of, 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 of generational, you know, name. These are people you know and love. These are people that you're worried about, that you're praying for, that you're concerned about. This is personal. And that's why this next quote should haunt us all by Russell Moore. He says this, we now see 
young evangelicals walking away from evangelicalism, not because they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. The presenting issue in this secularization is not scientism and hedonism, but disillusionment and cynicism. The next generation is not so much opposed to what we claim to believe. They're apathetic to what we claim to believe. And they no longer believe that our faith is relevant for real life as they enter it each and every day. See, the problem is not Christianity. It's the brand of Christianity that we're passing on to the next generation. Something's got to change. The data is just too clear. Each generation is becoming increasingly unchurched and unengaged in faith. Here's a Barna report from just two years ago in 2020, and you can see each generation becomes increasingly unengaged in church, in church attendance. You may be here if you're newer. You may look at that and go, well, I'm not even convinced church is important or critical for faith. And, and I would just take, give you another data point as you look at the information here on church attendance, that not only is church engagement in decline with each generation, hope is in decline with the next generation. A recent survey of teenagers revealed that only 24% believe that the progress of society will get better. 76% believe it will either stay the same or decline and get worse. The next generation is not only getting unengaged in church, but they are losing hope. So here's the question as we kick off today. What is the faith of the next generation worth? What is the faith of the next generation worth to us? You see, we don't want it to be divisive, but we also don't want their faith to be underdeveloped as they enter a complex adult world. This Karen Armstrong quote from her book, A Case for God, is, is really telling. She said, we often learn about God at about the same time we're learning about Santa Claus. But our ideas about Santa Claus change, they mature, and become more nuanced. Whereas our ideas of God can remain at a rather infantile level. And when we have a Sunday school faith and we enter a complex adult world, we have drop-off. And we're seeing that over and over again. Something must change. And so here's what I want to do. I just want to share four areas as we've been praying and talking about this that we want to improve as a church to better allow and encourage the next generation to grab onto a faith of their own as they enter this world. Number one, we must recruit and train great small group leaders because this is where the rubber meets the road. Right now, there are small group leaders, I'm pointing the wrong way, aren't I? I think it's that way. Small group leaders who are meeting with children right now and they're having real conversations about what their life is really like and how it intersects faith. In the same way they're doing it with students and this Wednesday night especially, they'll have a lot of conversations going on with these small group leaders and these students. And I can tell you, we are blessed to have small group leaders who are prepared and passionate. And let me tell you, students and children can tell when an adult walks in and really genuinely cares about them and it makes a difference. We have great small group leaders like these guys here. Here's a picture of Jerry, Austin, and Andrew. And I can tell you, many of you know these folks, but Jerry has been a small group leader since 2006. He took, yeah, isn't that crazy? He took, yeah, let's give it up for Jerry. Jerry's one of these real superheroes who's willing to take a group of second graders and took them all the way through their senior year, and if that wasn't enough, he went back and started with sixth graders again, and he's like on year three again. Like, he's just one of those people. And then Austin, who, Jerry's in his 50s, yeah, we can, uh, mom and dad, here we go with Austin, yeah, we can give it up for Austin. So... 
Austin just, he also grew up in our student ministry with the small groups and he's been leading for a few years and he's in his late 20s. And then we have Andrew and Andrew just graduated from high school and this is his very first year to lead in a small group. He also grew up in our student ministry with small groups. Yeah, let's give it up for Andrew. And here's what's amazing. We have all three of these guys who are serving in one small group together now Three generations together are pouring into the next generation. I don't know about you, I just think that's a pretty cool thing, and that's where faith is really grown. And so here's what I want to do before we move on, and I know that a lot of small group leaders are leading around the campus, so a lot of them aren't in here. But if you are a small group leader of children, of students, or of adults, Right now, would you stand if you're in the room and let us just recognize you right now? Would you just go ahead and stand? I know you're here. Some of you go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you very much. You guys are the ones who never want the attention. You are always doing work behind the scene, and you are always making a very real difference, and we say thank you, thank you, thank you. And let me just say, we need more people like this. We need more people like this for the sake of the next generation because in the spring, we need more adults to help with our children. We need more uh, small group leaders for our teenagers. And so here's what I want to ask you. I want to give you a call to action right now. If you've got your cell phone and you're like, you know what, I don't know if I want to do that, but I'll at least take some information on what it would look like to consider that then take out your phone right now, grab the camera app, and just click on the QR code on the back of the pew in front of you, and just click that you are interested in getting more information about students or children and being a group leader in that way. Why? Because the faith of the next generation is worth our investment, and this is one of the most practical ways we can invest in the next generation. So thank you for considering clicking that and letting us know that you're interested. Well, not only do we have to recruit and train great small group leaders so that great conversations can be happening, but number two, we have to shift our focus from believing in to following Jesus. It is not enough to say a one-time prayer, is it? It is not enough to say, yes, I believe. If I can be real brutally honest, Satan believes, but he doesn't follow. We don't want to just believe, we want to follow. And that's why we say in our mission that we want to share Jesus, yes, but we want to build believers. In other words, we don't want to just create believers. We want to build believers. We want people who are following Jesus. Another way to say that is we don't want Christianity to be a reference point in your life. We want Christianity to be the center of your entire life. Reference point is temple model thinking where you go with the sacred place, with sacred laws, you learn a little bit, and you go about your real week, the rest of the week, doing your real life. But what we're talking about, that's believing in. But following Jesus is just the center of your life where you go, no, 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 it's a sacred love that's a a seven-day-a-week faith. This is really the anchor and the center around which I orient my entire life. It's a very different way of living. And here's why it's so important. Because when a pastor has a moral failure, it isn't because they stopped believing. They stopped following. Following is a big difference from believing. And can I get a little more personal? If you were to ask every Christian in this room, everyone would agree that we should financially support the church, but more than 70% don't. Because following is different than believing. Following backs up what I believe with action. And guess what? This is why it's so important that we talk about this. The next generation notices what we say we believe versus how we follow this Jesus. How much does it cost us to follow Jesus? How much investment are we making How much are we orienting our life around this Jesus? Got quiet in here. Let's move on to number three. We must also involve them, the next generation, as early as possible in ministry. Involve them before they're ready, before we're ready in ministry. 
This is so important. I love that Kara, who gave the announcements today, one of our students, who also serves in the children, along with 14 other middle school and high school students who serve in our children's ministry. I love that. I also think of 20 years ago, there was a man by the name of Chuck Sherry, who was a high school group leader. And he saw this young teenager who had a guitar and thought, you know what? You need to jump into ministry even though I know you don't think you're ready. And that young teenager wasn't ready. And that young teenager was invited to come and to begin to lead worship in high school. And that young teenager talked about the first time he led high school. Chuck Sherry stood front and center and was singing so obnoxiously loud because this young teenager was off key and Chuck was trying to help him get back on key. And then all of a sudden, he appreciated Chuck Sherry even more. And because Chuck believed in this young teenager, this young teenager's faith grew because there's something about personal ministry that just grows our faith. And this young teenager began to grow his faith, and this young teenager grew up and eventually became our worship pastor, Ryan Axtell, because of a man like Chuck who said, I will put you in front of people way before you're ready. I believe in the next generation. And I believe there are a lot of Ryan Axdells in our student ministry and in our children's ministry who just need to be encouraged and they need to be allowed to serve before they're even ready. That's how their faith will grow. But finally, if we really are serious about the next generation, then we have to keep our church a partisan-free zone. And this is where we've become increasingly divided as a nation, as a world, frankly. But in the light of the prayer of unity that Jesus prayed at the end of his life, We have to get this right. We can't politicize the church. We can't politicize God's church. If we do, we will say goodbye to the next generation. Think about it. The early Christians, they were forced to declare the difference between their loyalty to Caesar or their loyalty to Jesus, and they chose Jesus at all cost. They may have been fans of politics, but they were followers of Jesus, And in our generation, more and more Christians are becoming fans of Jesus and followers of politics. And the next generation notices. I hear this often. Many pastors do. It's certainly not just me. But over the last several years, I've heard it in different churches. And people will say, Mark, we need to take a stand. You just need to get up there and you need it, whether it's this candidate, whether it's this election, whether it's this issue, but it's time that we were bold and it's time that we take a stand. There's a little this, uh, chest bumping in that and, and I get it. I feel it too. But, but I want to be clear, this is where I take a stand. I take a stand and give my full allegiance to King Jesus And just like those first generation Christians, I want us to be a group of people who say that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And that means politics is not the way, the truth, or the life, and no one comes to God through politics. And that means we don't want to be a people who ever put our hope in politics, but to put our hope in Christ alone, the cornerstone. Furthermore, I say we align ourselves with the Apostle Peter who said that there is salvation found in no other name but the name of Jesus. And so I say let's stand on his name, the name above all names, right? Well, I feel better. But the faith of the next generation is at stake. It really is. And if we get this wrong, we lose them. This is why it's so important that we're not trying to invite the next generation to believe something, but instead we're trying to invite them to follow someone. And his name is Jesus. Jesus said, well, if we're more united, they will be more willing to believe that he was sent from God. Our unity in our current generation impacts the believability of Jesus in the next generation. So here's the question. What is the faith of the next generation worth? See, the word worth implies that there is a cost, that we will have to lay down some preferences. We will have to lay down some platforms. We will have to lay down some ways that we like doing things, we can effectively do things in order to build the faith 
of that next generation. But here's why I'm encouraged. Because that's been our heart from day one. We care about the next generation here. It was just three weeks ago, I was actually in uh, PG's small group. PG, are you here? Where are you? There you are. Okay, just making sure you made it to church. I knew you were busy this morning uh, with your group, but uh, PG's uh, small group was meeting, and, and we small group. There were like 75 people there that day, I think. We were having lunch, and, and we were just talking about a lot of things, and I'll never forget what Pauline Johnson said. Pauline uh, was at that meeting, and, and, and if you don't know Pauline and Charlie, they're sitting right here on the front row. Come on now. First of all, that's pretty awesome. Pauline, yeah. Pauline and Charlie both are, are retired professors, and they've been attending LifePoint for 12 years or so, and I'll never forget that day as we sat in that large group, and we were talking about kind of the pain points of what it would mean to move from here to a new campus, to a new location, and we were kind of talking about the future. I'll never forget what Pauline said. Pauline, she said, Mark, I, I don't want to go to a church with just old people. I want our church to reach young families again. She said, Charlie and I live about two minutes from the church. We could walk to church. But we're more than happy to drive to the new campus, no matter how far it is. And when we can no longer drive, we'll be happy to catch a ride with someone else in order to reach younger families. Don't you love that heart? That's the kind of heart I want to have. And I know that's our heart. I know that's our heart to reach people, to make an impact, to further the gospel. It's one of the things I love about our church. And can I just say, this is one of the things I get excited about as we look forward, as we anticipate whatever God, because here's what we all know. We're on a journey of faith as a church. And here's what we also know. God is on his throne. We are his church. We're in his hands. So we're in good hands. But we're going on a journey of faith together. And what does the future look like? And I just want to say, as we've been praying together, one of the things I am convinced God is revealing to us is there is coming a day he is leading us where there will be increasing numbers of people in the next generations behind us who will come and who will wrestle with their faith. And as they wrestle with their faith, one of the things that's going to happen because of you is there will be small group leaders who lead conversations with students and with children, and we will have hallways where there are hundreds of these conversations echoing through the hallways as people are wrestling with, what does this mean in the real life as I'm seeing it Monday through Saturday? And we will be a partisan-free zone in our culture that continues to become increasingly divided. We will do everything that we can to elevate Jesus' name above every name and be a place where the next generation can belong before they believe. And my prayer is that lives would be transformed and we would eventually see baptisms every Sunday. We would see people declaring their faith publicly each and every week. And my prayer is that instead of in five or 10 years right now, the trend is that fewer people will go to church and more people will walk away from their faith. But as a result of a step that we are being led to take as a church, I pray then in our region that more people will come to faith, that more people will attend church, and that the next generation will grab onto a deeper faith because we are committed to pay the price, whatever it takes to reach them. And if that happens, it will be because of you. It will be because of you and your commitment to pay the cost that we become a church where the next generation can belong before they believe. Now, as I wrap up this message, we also wrap up this series. And if you missed it, in week one, we talked about our vision, and that is a place that shares Jesus and builds believers. We just want to do that for the rest of our lives. We also look forward and we say, but we specifically want to be a church where anyone can belong before they believe, even if you're a despised tax collector. And then we talked about, in week three, the future and the specific update for our church. And then last week, We talked about that question, instead of what does the law require of me that many of us inherently go toward, the better question that Jesus introduced is what does love require of me? When there's someone different than me, that's the question through which I filter my response. And then today, what is the faith of the next generation worth? Jesus gathers with these people at a table there and there's tax collectors and sinners and his disciples. And everybody's happy at the table except for one onlooking group 
the religious. And they're like, what is this all about? Why is he doing this? Why does he allow them here? They don't believe or behave right. And Jesus, Mark 2, 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Mark 2, 17. And this is our memory verse, so I want to ask you to say it out loud with me. We'll put it on the screen, and then we'll give you the test. We'll take it away and let you say it once from memory. Say this with me. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Mark 2, 17. Now say it with me. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Mark 2, 17. Hey, give yourselves a hand. Great job as you put that one to memory. Well, we mentioned weekly baptisms, and as we plan for the future, we get a preview of that right here today. You may remember that video earlier with Jacob and and Kyle, and Jacob specifically, before inviting Kyle, say that Jacob was invited by a man named Andrew. And did you catch who Andrew is? Andrew's that middle small group leader who invited Jacob, who invited Kyle, who gave his life to Jesus and is eternally changed. Not because of a great message or a great song, but because the message of a group leader. This is where it makes a difference. This is where the next generation's faith is grown. If you're new here today, before we celebrate Kyle's baptism along with some others, if you're wondering, now what is baptism exactly? Well, just know that a group of people who are about to be baptized have made an internal decision to follow Jesus. And now they're going to have an outward expression of that internal decision. And it's this beautiful picture of the story of Jesus who was buried after he died on the cross and then he rose again. And baptism, as we echo the story of the church throughout the last 2,000 years, followers of Jesus have been going public through baptism in obedience of Jesus. And so now we're going to get to once again experience that here today. And so what that means is we have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot of reason to celebrate. So I hope you're ready to celebrate today. And so with that said, what we're going to do is they're right outside. We're going to watch it on video. So if you would direct your attention to the screen and let's celebrate with baptism. I'll turn it over to our student pastor, Pastor Ben. Hey guys, I'm Ben. I'm so excited. We are right up front and we've got five baptisms that we're going to do today. So I'm going to invite Ryan into the pool. He's going to be the very first one. Ryan, come on down. Ryan, have you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you, my brother, in the the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Our next one coming down. Y'all know him already. This is Kyle. Kyle, we're excited. Kyle, have you put your faith in in Jesus as your Savior. Yes. With that profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You guys, this is this is my friend Malachi. <laughs> Meg, have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? With that profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Julia, have you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior? Yes. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit.
last but not least, we have Susan. Susan, have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. With that profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Man, that's all of our baptisms today. Guys, thank y'all so much. We're so excited. I hope today's message was an encouragement to you. And if you'd like a little more information about our church, just visit us on our website at lifepointplano.org.